Good evening and welcome to Epworth United Methodist Church as we observe our Lord's crucifixion on the day we call Good Friday. I'm the Reverend Terry Cofiel and we're glad that you joined us this evening. The Reverend Bill Jones will be joining us via remote later in this service. But we begin with a time of contemplation as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship as we listen to our prelude. Please join with me responsively in our invitation to grace. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. We invite you now to join in singing the old rugged cross.
This evening's service is a combination of traditions for observing Good Friday. It is a remembrance of those seven last word services. When I was a child, I remember when schools were closed, we would go to church at 12 in the afternoon and we would worship until 3 p.m. We would hear seven sermons on the words that Jesus spoke from the cross in three of the four Gospels, in Matthew, in Luke, and in John. We're combining that with a tenebrae, which is a service of shadows. After each reflection on each word from the cross, we'll extinguish a candle until we remember the time when the sky turned dark as our Lord Jesus lost his life on the cross and gave us our lives in return. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Although our Lenten services have been interrupted by the pandemic, some of us have continued to study the words of the writers of Amish Grace, a story of how forgiveness transcended tragedy. We've been challenged to think about who it is we need to forgive and what we need to do to be able to forgive. For me, forgiveness begins and ends on the cross of Jesus Christ. As he looks upon those who crucified him, as he looks upon those who called out in horrible names and rejection, he looks to his father and calls down forgiveness on them. Eckhart Tolle, who is a philosopher and a man who writes about spiritual things, says that if we focus too much on the future, we're not living enough in the presence. Not present, but presence. He also says our inability to forgive means that we're living too much in the past and not enough in the presence. As we look upon Jesus from the cross, calling forgiveness on his fallen creation, we must live in his presence if we ever hope to follow him in the way of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Our Lord was crucified between two common criminals, two bandits, two thieves. And one cries out to him, hoping against hope that he may be who others claim he is, the Son of God. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which our Lord replies, knowing this man's sin, today you will be with me in paradise the power of forgiveness, the power of love, the power of grace, and the power of hope come together in this, the second word. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise.
Woman, here is your son, here is your mother. It seems like just a few weeks ago that we sang the words together, here in this very sanctuary, as we lowered the lights to share the light of Christ. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. We read how when Mary and Joseph took their infant son with the gift of poor people, the gift of two turtle doves to the temple to make sacrifice at the time of his birth. Simeon, the old prophet, saw him and felt his spirit leap within him. He took the baby in his arms, not a common thing for a man to do in that culture and in that time. And he gave thanks to God for being able to live to see the salvation that had been promised to his ancestors, that had been born in Bethlehem. But he looked at Mary and he said to her, a sword will pierce your soul. And that day, that silent night has come. So he looks upon his mother knowing that a widow, which she probably was at that point in her life, was very vulnerable. And in his own agony, he thinks not of his own pain, but of his mother. And he looks at the beloved disciple John, and he says to her, this is your son now. And to his dear friend, he says, this is now your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is one of those ones that's hard for us to understand. It's hard for folks outside the church who don't know the Psalms to understand that our Lord was not cursing his father. He was not proclaiming his desertion as much as he was in the way of his ancestors, crying out to God in his agony and in his despair as well as in his joy and his exaltation. He is too weak to continue, but I would encourage you to pick up your Bible and open it to the 22nd Psalm and to read the ending when the one who has felt so dejected and alone is able again to praise his God. In these difficult days, when we live in fear of what lies ahead with a pandemic, with the economic situation in the country, and so much unemployment, we might feel abandoned. But when our Lord hung on the cross, at what seemed the moment of their deepest separation, he was never closer than that moment to his father. And his father did not forsake him, had not abandoned him, and he will not abandon us. So that at the end of what comes, we can with the psalmist cry out, I will again praise you, my Lord and my God. I am thirsty. Jesus, in the first sign, for John they weren't miracles, they were signs of who he was in his God and who God had created him to be and how from the beginning of John's gospel the word became flesh 
and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And so the first sign is that Jesus goes to a wedding and his mother says to him, they're out of wine. He gives her a sort of an offhanded reply, what business is that of mine, woman? She ignores that and tells the servants to do what he asks and he gets the rain barrels and turns the water to wine. Not just wine, but very good wine in abundance. It's also in John's Gospel that Jesus goes to the woman at the well in Samaria. She's surprised that he asks for a drink from her own bucket, something a Jewish man or any man would not have done. And as she pulls the water from the well, he tells her about her life. He's seen the men that she's lived with. The man that she's living with now is not her husband. And he doesn't condemn her. Instead, he offers her living water that will bubble up to eternal life. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And now, as he is on the cross, our Lord, the living water of God, thirsts. May we remember his promise to live in us so that our faith might spring up in joyous streams of service and refreshment to others, so that we might truly let him live in us and flow through us. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Before he dies, Jesus claims the promise that we all hope for, that when we leave this mortal body, we believe in the promise of the resurrection that will take us to new and to eternal life in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As I just said, he was never closer to his father than at the moment that he left his earthly life to return to his native heaven, to claim his rightful place with God his father. And so let us commend our spirits to God, not just at the moment of our death, but with every waking moment, every hour that we are given, so that we may serve God with joy and fullness of life for every day that we have in this world. It is finished. Not a good translation of the word finished, we think of finished as something that is spent and done and over with. A more accurate translation from the Greek is it is accomplished. We need to remember that in John's Gospel, Jesus, on the night before he dies, when he's with his disciples, when he gives that command to love one another, he also says to them, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down and I take it up again. And the words that we hear so often read at funerals, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. And they said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know how to get there? How do we know the way? And Jesus says to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. And one of my favorite promises in all of Scripture when Jesus looks at his disciples and says to them, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It is accomplished.
Our reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which had not, they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities, and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his, when you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through the knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Would you join now in singing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord?
what our Lord saw from the cross. This was a watercolor painting by a very famous biblical illustrator named James Tissot. He was French. This was painted sometime between 1885 and 1895. The date has been lost to history. People were scandalized when they saw this painting because they thought what an audacious thing to do to take Christ's perspective. But look at the picture. This is the view from the cross. Jesus looks down and he sees his mother, the beloved disciple. He sees the centurion who will later proclaim that truly this was God's son. He sees the crowd, both those who quietly support him, as well as those who are calling names at him, hurling insults at him, thinking that they've finally gotten rid of this blasphemer and this pretender. He doesn't see many of his disciples because they were terrified and they ran and they hid. At the moment, he needed them most dearly. They were nowhere to be seen. But I believe that what our Lord saw from the cross in that crowd was me and you. Each of us for whom he lived, each of us for whom he died, each of us for whom he has been raised. And just as he promised the disciples on the night before he died, he will come again to take us that we might be with him always because his father's house has many rooms and he has prepared a place there for us. Go into this night knowing the love that God has for you, the depth of that love revealed in this service, in these words spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ at the time of his own suffering. He has come and he will come again to take us to himself. But he is with us always because that baby born in Bethlehem is Emmanuel, God who is with us. And even death itself cannot break that power. Go into the night quietly with that hope in your heart to await the resurrection and the blessings of God Almighty who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit will be with you now and always. Amen.